Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 107. Perspectives, Part 2. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my insightful and intelligent co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. Anything exciting to report? I just had a quiz in the L.A., and today was actually a pretty chill day other than that. So then, no, nothing exciting to report. Sure, why not? No, <laughs> no, not really. So this is the second part of our... Teenage Perspectives, uh, two-part series, I guess we could say. It's going to be kind of a question and answer session like last week. This week, we're going to have a couple different topics. We're going to be talking about parenting. Then we'll talk about relationships. Dun, dun, dun. And then finally, we'll finish off talking about technology. We've got 10 questions in each. We will... Go through those, and if there's questions that you can't answer, just let me know. We can try and clarify, or we'll just push them to another another session after you've had a chance to get more of a pers- perspective on it. Okay. Before we start, I would encourage folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions of our podcast listed as Insights into Things. You can get audio versions of the podcast, this podcast in particular, listed as Insights into Teens. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, and any place you can get a podcast these days. I would also encourage folks to give us some feedback. Contact us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, you can get us at Insights into Things, or you can get links to all those and direct contacts to us on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready? Yes, we are. Let's get started. So we're going to start off today with parenting questions. Uh, So we're going to kind of ask you questions about how your parents treat you and how you think you would be as a parent or your perspective on parenting. Okay. Okay. Some of these questions are a little, I don't know, off the wall, I guess. So question number one, should men get paternity leave from work? So before we get into that, let me quickly explain that paternity leave, when a, when, a, when a mother is having a baby, um, there's what's called the FMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act. Okay. And that grants the mothers up to 12 weeks of maternity leave either before or after the birth of the child. Now, <clears throat> with that in mind, do you think the father should get a similar block of time off to stay home, help the mom out, you know, get to know the baby, that sort of thing. I definitely think so, especially if, like, they're a single father and, like, they, like, have, like, they adopt a brand new um, baby that they kind of need to get to know a bit more. I would definitely say um, for that. Especially for, um, also making sure that, um, their, um, the mother is well and, you know, getting to know the kid. So I'd say that they should get parentality leave. And, and I would agree with you. When you were born, <clears throat> you had some, some issues where you had to stay in the hospital. 
Uh, but mommy had uh, delivered via C-section, so she couldn't come home right after giving birth either. So she was in, uh, I don't know, four days, five days, something like that. Uh, but when she got home, she had the physical restrictions because she was still healing. So uh, there was a lot of stuff that she couldn't do. The As much as I can call it an advantage, the one advantage of you having to remain in the hospital even after mommy came home was that mommy had a chance to rest at home and heal up before we actually had you home and she was on the go constantly. So it totally makes sense. And under FMLA, eligible employees, male or female, are allowed up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave. So basically your employer has to hold your job for you. Mm -hmm. So that is there. So and and I agree with you 100% there. So question number two deals with curfews. Do curfews... Well, first of all, let me ask, do we do we put a curfew on you? I mean, kind of. By 8, I need to be downstairs to watch um, our show, our, my show with Mommy. And by 9 is kind of when I go to bed. Yeah, but because you don't really go out and socialize a lot, there's not much occasion to give you a curfew. Like when I when I was your age, I would go out and hang out with my friends and stuff like that. But I had a 10 o'clock curfew. Um uh, during school week. Um, so I had to be home by 10 o'clock. And, and, you know, usually my best friend lived on the next street over, so I was never very far from home. So the question here is, do curfews keep teens out of trouble? I would say it depends on the teen. Like, I definitely think that um, teens who are a lot more obedient, um, like... The teens that will abide by it and won't question the parents' decision, it can definitely keep them out of trouble, especially if they were to stay out late at night and something would happen to them. But then we have the teens who kind of break their curfews and get infuriated by them, and it kind of gets them into even more trouble, not just in danger, but also trouble with peers and parents. So... I'd say it really kind of depends on how the kid, how the kid is. That's interesting. I hadn't I hadn't considered the the fact that the curfew itself could be a, an aggravating factor there. Next question: Is child behavior better or worse than it was years ago? So before I answer this, could you um give me kind of an overview of what child up child behavior was like in the past? Well, when I grew up, a lot of what we did was outside the house. So we were constantly out playing or hanging out or playing sports. Or if you were over somebody's house, you were over their house for a short period of time that there wasn't as much online. Well, there was no online activity. So everything occurred outside. And... When things are, you know, outside, you run into stuff where kids get bored and they start doing things that they probably shouldn't be doing, trespassing on other people's property, damaging people's property when they play games. Like we used to play a game on my street called Manhunt, and it was basically a modified version of hide and seek in teams, but you weren't doing it. In ju- on the street. So you were running through people's backyards and, and on people's properties and stuff like that. And occasionally we would break things. Um, but that was all a factor of everything being outside the house for us. So nowadays you don't have as much of that. And a lot, a lot of times you're in the house a lot more than you are outside the house now. So kind of look at it from that perspective. So I could definitely say that... I mean, kids haven't gotten into trouble with their neighbors as much as they used to. Like, I do, but I do still see kids outside, so that's a good thing. But there's also a problem with kids when they are are on the internet too much. Some kids can be pretty cruel, and there are a lot of, like, things that kids have kind of messed up because they are bored on the internet and don't really think that it their opinion affects people um so it's kind of 50 50 at this point um they're probably not doing physical damage but 
they're also still kind of doing damage. So I'd say just watch out for your kids. Yeah, and I would agree with you there. I think <clears throat> I think some of the bad behaviors, or most of the bad behaviors, are still there. They just take on a different form now. Yeah. Um, you would trespass on people's property before, but you may be trespassing on people's social media or their uh, websites or something like that now. And, and I think the risks probably are a little bit higher now because the exposure that you have in an online world is significantly greater than you did in your neighborhood. Yeah. You know, when we were growing up, you always were told to watch out for suspicious cars or, or people that were, you know, adults that you didn't know who were talking to the kids. And that was the sort of um, predatory type individual. You could see him. It was very clear. <clears throat> so you knew who it was and you knew they didn't belong. Whereas online, you were exposed to a much wider array of people that you have to be careful with. And you don't know who they are because they're hiding behind a keyboard somewhere. So someone who may be pretending to be another 14-year-old girl who's trying to empathize with you and, and relate to you might be a 50-year-old man who's trying to lure you out of the house to do something inappropriate. And you don't know that because it's not that obvious. Yeah. So the dangers are, I think, significantly higher. Yeah. Question number four. And again, I think this one is also really tied to technology. Should companies market to children? Uh, um, I mean, I think some companies definitely shouldn't because a lot of it's just like, hey, get your parents to get you this and spend money on our products. Like, I think that's kind of the main thing that people do. But I think it's really bad when, like, what they're marketing is not child friendly and shouldn't be exposed to children that's probably when it really gets to be a problem um i'm pretty sure we're not going to be able to stop companies from marketing to children and i don't think there's anything wrong with kids wanting to have toys it's just the companies clearly just want to make money and some companies don't entirely care about the kids safety they just want to make money so yeah, there's a certain point where they should probably not. Yeah, and, and you know, this goes back to the technology again. You know, when I was a kid, the only marketing I was really exposed to was television or radio or whatever the medium happened to be at the time. <clears throat> so I'd watch Saturday morning cartoons or whatever I watched when I got home from school, and you would get this influx of product marketing to that age group. Um and it was a very non – it was targeted to the age group, but it wasn't targeted to me. Whereas with the technology we have today <clears throat> and the amount of tracking that happens with your online presence, people – companies can market directly to you now by looking at what websites you go to, what products you buy, what videos you watch, who your friends are. Um, the region that you live in. So they have so much information on you now that you get these personalized ads where it's almost like they're talking directly to you. And that can be much more intoxicating to a teen <clears throat> than seeing a generic ad for a new toy. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a more personalized, but in some way more powerful form of marketing as well. Yeah. Question number six. No. Question number five. Counting. Math is so tough. <laughs> when should parents let teens make their own decisions? So I don't think there's a defined time for this, and it really just depends on how mature the teen is when they're making their decisions. If they're mature enough and they've been and they've been shown that they can make their own decisions, I'd say then you can let them make their don't their own decisions on what they like, what they don't like, that kind of thing. Um, but I do think that there are some teens that make pretty bad decisions, and 
parents kind of have to have a bit more control with them and not to let them make too many of their own decisions just to keep them safe at least. That's a good point. It's, it's more of a judgment call <clears throat> than, you know, saying that you're 13, you can make your own decisions now. Yeah. And it's, you know, you, you invest a certain amount of responsibility in the child and see how they react to it. Some react well and they can handle it. Some, some can't. And you kind of have to pull back on the reins a little bit until they get a little bit more mature. Now, question number six. It was such a good question, I wanted to skip everything else. <laughs> Do teens have decent role models today? I don't entirely know how to answer this because, personally, I don't entirely have role models that I'm pretty sure plenty of other people have. Like, of course, I have the generic you and mommy as my role models, but... I don't entirely... I don't consider myself generic at all, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's just I don't... I don't entirely know how to answer this because I don't know, like... I really don't have any experience with role models in the media for teens, at least. Um, like, I don't know really how to answer that. Well, and I can tell you that as a as a child, as a teenager myself, <clears throat> most of my role models, I drew on fiction for my role models because I don't know. I, I think I think creatively, things were a lot more black and white when I was a kid. You know, you had good guys and you had bad guys. There weren't shades of gray in between. You were either one or the other. Mm -hmm. And it made it very easy to look at things that I was interested in. TV shows, for instance. Um, Transformers was a great one. I used to love Transformers. Um, Optimus Prime. You know, Optimus Prime was the ultimate good guy. He was always a good guy. He always did the right thing. Uh, was a cool-looking truck. Had, you know, a really, you know, Peter Cullen did the voice. He did an awesome voice for Optimus Prime. But... You had these moral good versus evil plays where it made it very easy to pick the good guy or to recognize the bad guy. And, you know, whether it was Transformers or G.I. Joe or Star Wars or whatever it was, I never looked at celebrities as role models. I never, like a lot of people worship celebrities. I never really got into that. Yeah, neither did I. Right. So my thing was always either characters from literature or um, television shows or movies or whatever, that was, that was who I related to. You know, that was the character that I could get into. And that was where the life lessons were a lot of times because it was so black and white. And I don't think today's entertainment for teens is that black and white. You have so many anti-heroes now, so many... So many heroes or so, so many characters that play both sides of that fence. And sometimes they're morally ambiguous. Um, you have a lot more flawed characters that you see in television and movies now. Um, so it's not as easy to see what, what a good guy or a bad guy is in, in fictional accounts. So I think a lot of teens turn towards athletes. Or celebrities, and they see, oh, you know, this guy, uh, a basketball player who uh, grew up poor and got his big shot, and now he's uh, a multimillionaire and he's got his own shoe line. That's who I want to be because he's so successful. And I think the reason behind some of that motivation for using them as a role model might not might be disingenuous from what role models were when I was a kid, at least. I mean, yeah, I can understand that. Um, and I definitely think that some fictional characters might, act, like, it's definitely hard to depict who's good and who's bad. Um, so, yeah, I can definitely understand your aspect of that. Okay. So the next question we have is, is there too much of an attitude of entitlement in today's youth? You know what, me, what I mean by that? Yeah, and... Yeah, I'm pretty sure that lots of kids at this point have kind of gotten the feeling of being really entitled. Um, there are plenty of kids who are demanding, 
who are spoiled, who want everything in the world and don't think they need to work hard for it. There's a lot of kids like that that I've been seeing recently, and there's... I definitely think there's a bit too much entitlement and attitude in today's youth. Of course, there are exceptions to that, but overall, when you take a group of kids, most of them are more than likely going to have some form of entitlement. Okay, fair enough. So the next question has to deal with chores and getting paid for them, which you do. So the question is, should teens get paid to do chores around the house? So I think teens should be at least somewhat rewarded for their chores. Like, I can definitely see a family who can't entirely afford to pay their teen for their chores, so you don't actually have to give them money for it. But I would say at least giving them some type of reward so that they can still stay motivated, and it's like, oh, hey, if I do my chores, I get this. And it's a good way of teaching them hard work and how to motivate you, and giving them motivation and and a reward for doing hard work. And and I agree with you 100%, which is why we do pay you to do yours. And I'll even go a little bit beyond that, is it teaches you the value of a dollar. And this kind of goes hand in hand with that sense of entitlement where a lot of kids, the kids that don't have to work for the things that they want and just have it handed to them, generally, and and there are exceptions, but generally there's a lack of appreciation for what it takes to get the things you want. You know, you want a new game system, you want a new book bag, you want a new bicycle, whatever it is. If it's just given to you, then you don't have an investment in it and you don't treat it with the respect you would if you had earned it. But when you work and you earn the money and you take your money and spend it either on yourself or someone else, there's a much greater investment in what you're spending that on. You respect your property more when you've worked to earn that property. Mm-hmm. And and I think kids that don't have that reward motivation to do chores don't gain the benefit of that appreciation. <clears throat> but you clearly appreciate the things that you have, which is which is a good thing. It means that mommy and I are doing something right around here. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Question nine. How should parents discipline their children in today's society? Okay, so this also kind of depends on the kid. Um, if the kid has shown to be well, you don't really have to dis like the discipline doesn't have to entirely be harsh. If the kid like doesn't care and doesn't understand and really doesn't have any um really once again doesn't care, then I definitely think the punishment like the uh ah, not punishment, discipline should be a bit harder on them. Um but there's definitely one thing that I can agree that should never be implemented in discipline. Don't harm your kid. N- violence. Physically, is- you mean? Physically. And mentally. Mo- mentally, I, we shouldn't harm you either? Yeah, we okay, shouldn't. I'll write that you one down. You shouldn't hurt your kids in any way. That's pretty much what I'm saying. Like, don't hurt them emotionally. Don't hurt them physically. Don't hurt them mentally. Violence, in either sense, is never the option. So, bearing that in mind, what do you consider to be acceptable discipline? Um... I definitely think that, um, like, taking away small benefits is an exceptional way to discipline your kids, like taking away one of their toys or taking away their device. Like, so, so like, no, you do something wrong and you don't get your game system for this week. Well, if it is an <clears throat> extreme thing. I definitely think that you should probably have a talk a bit more and, like, some small form of punishment, um, maybe, like, maybe say this time that you maybe do your chores, but you don't get paid, that kind of thing. Okay, so deprivation rather than anything harsh. Yeah, and, like, maybe you should work with your teen a bit more, and you can then kind of decide which punishment would be better. Well, punishment, di- wait, form of discipline, I prefer to say. Sure. Um, 
So, yeah. Okay, that works. So the last question we had in this category, <clears throat> and then we can give you your, your, your uh, parenting certificate, <laughs> is at what age do you think, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what age is it okay for kids to stay home by themselves? Okay, going along with the other question, I don't think there is a defined <coughs> age for, um, for a teen to have, to stay home by themselves it's more or less if the parents feel they are responsible enough um it can they stay home by themselves without causing harm to the house or themselves that's basically kind of what the parents have to think about because um i definitely think some teens can't stay home by themselves who are about the same age as me um and I definitely think that there are some teens who are about my age that are probably mature enough that they can stay home alone. So it really just depends if they can handle the responsibility. So another judgment call by the parents based on how the child reacts to it. Yep. Understood. Sounds good. That's all we had for this uh, series of questions. We'll be right back and we'll talk about technology. For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. We're getting perspectives, teen perspectives. Up next is actually relationships. We're not going to talk about technology yet. That was just a tease for the end of the show. <laughs> so sure. our first question on relationships, because I know you love talking about relationships. Mm -hmm. Does age matter in a relationship? Definitely. That is probably one of the only factors that matters in a relationship. You can like whatever gender you want, you can have whatever preference, but one thing that should matter, probably one of the only things that matters, is age. Like, like hands down, I don't I don't care if you say, oh, it's okay for someone who's 10 years younger to date someone. No. Age matters in a relationship, and you cannot change my mind. So, explain to me why age matters. Beca because, okay, so... The main problem with this is when you think about someone who could be... Someone kind of young... Dating someone who's old enough to be their parent. Like, that feeling just makes many people, m myself included, extremely uncomfortable. And especially if you're going, if we're thinking about younger kids, yes, age definitely matters in a relationship. No one's going to change my mind. Age is the only factor that would matter in any type of relationship. Well, you seem very strong about this. Definitely, yes. Well, I have to tell my brother, who married someone who was younger. He's 10 years older than me. He married someone who was younger than I was. And to the best of my knowledge, you're still happily married. You have certain marriages. You have um, Michael Douglas, I think, is, is a good example. His wife, I think, is almost 20 years younger than he is. And they have a very successful, very happy, productive marriage. I mean, I guess 
in certain instances, but still kind of the thought of that, like, yeah, I get it, people can be happy, but... It's, uh... I think there's probably a point where age starts to matter less and less. I guess. And, and I think, I totally agree with you from a teen standpoint that... I would not feel comfortable with you ever dating someone who was significantly older than you. And when I say significantly older, I'm saying maybe five years or more is too much. Yeah. Um, but I think once you hit adulthood and you meet somebody, regardless of their age, if they are someone who you can relate to that, that you fall in love with, and that you enjoy being around, I don't think age should be a limiting factor. I think what you might find is that if that age gap is too great, the two have very, the two individuals have less in common uh, to build a relationship on because as that age gap increases, the difference in personality and experience and preferences and all that stuff starts to, to get different. And for some people, that difference is exactly what they thrive on because they offer each other something that they never could have experienced with someone their own age. Because, you know, the, the, maybe the older person in that relationship is, feels younger with that younger person. And that younger person feels more entitled, more privileged being with an older person who's more established professionally and mature wise and attitude wise. So there's, there's trade-offs there. But I, I agree to a certain extent that there's a an age where that probably starts becoming less of a factor. Uh, yeah, I guess I can understand that. So sticking with the whole age thing, what age is appropriate for dating? And I'll say that with a caveat that we live in New Jersey and state to state that age varies, the age of consent. And when I say consent, we're talking about uh, sex. Yes, I know. I said that nasty word. It's okay. So most states, it's either 16, 17, or 18. In New Jersey, the age of consent is 16. Just because you're dating someone doesn't mean that that becomes a factor. But for the purpose of this discussion, it's important to know what those legal ramifications are. Okay. So with that in mind, what age is appropriate for dating, do you think? So, consent aside, I would think that maybe at 16 would be a decent time to date. Of course, you don't have to date immediately when you're 16. You don't have to date at all, in fact. Um, but I would definitely say that give yourself time to figure out who you want to date, if you want to date, that kind of thing. And if you do want to date... I'd say at least 16. Consent, I feel, should probably be a bit higher, though. Not gonna lie, but if you just want to date someone, then I'd say 16 should be the minimum. And I would tend to agree with that. And I would also agree with the statement you made that you don't need to immediately start dating when you're 16. I didn't seriously date until I got out of high school because I was involved in so many different things and I was working and you know, all kinds of personal stuff going on. You know, I dated a little bit, but it wasn't anything serious. I didn't look to really date until I was a little bit more established. Let's, let's be honest. It's, it's expensive dating. <laughs> so if you can't finance that and, and don't want to depend on your parents, then you might want to wait before you start dating. Uh, let's see. Question number three, another age related one here. Should young couples be able to marry? Now, again, a caveat with that, in the United States, I don't know about other countries, but in the United States, an individual can marry at the age of 18 without parental consent or authorization. Younger than that, your parents have to consent to it. Now, I'll say with that in mind that there are people that have been married as young as 12 years old over the course of history in this country. So, should young couples be able to marry? I mean, not very, very young couples. I don't 
entirely feel like marriage is a big thing and basically you're saying okay this is a person i want to spend the rest of my life with yes it can get a divorce but that's a whole nother can of worms you probably don't want to open um so i mean i guess as long as they really figure out like as long as they know what they're in for i guess that it would be okay but i would say um I would kind of prefer it if the youngest age was maybe 20, 21. It's, it's kind of the same thing with the military thing we talked about in the last, um, video. Um, I don't entirely feel comfortable with, like, older teens marrying because, like, you don't make the best decisions when, like, you make a lot of life decisions at 18, and I don't feel as though marriage should be one of them. And I would agree with you there. I think, I think depending on the gender dynamic of the relationship, half of that relationship may not be mature enough to make that decision. And there's a lot of other world decisions that have to get made before you get to that point. And not only is dating expensive, marriage is very expensive. So if you don't have the means to support yourself and your family, you're probably better off waiting to get married and waiting to start a family until you're a little bit more established. Mm -hmm. But that's just my philosophy. So, is it okay for girls to ask boys out? Sure. I don't see a problem with it. Same thing with girls proposing to guys. I really don't see any problem with it. Like, girls can make the first move. I don't really see a problem with that. Okay, well, moving right along. I mean, yeah, I don't really... Not much discussion to happen there. <laughs> yeah, I don't really have much else to say. Like, I I kind of thought that girls would, like, sometimes ask guys out on the like on their own. So you're not a traditional, you know, romantic person where you expect chivalry to be still alive and guys to hold doors open and pull chairs out for women and stuff? Oh, trust me, no. that Like, that is not equal rights. People might... People might think it's nice at first, but then you realize, yeah, why can't the woman do that? So you're more for equal rights and less for chivalrous conduct. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. I think that's a fair way to go through life. I think it's, it sets the expectations much more realistic at that point. So, online dating. So according to a study published by the Pew Research Center... Roughly 60% of participants have had positive experiences with dating platforms. Now, before I ask the question, I will put the caveat out there that your mother and I met through an online dating service. And we are, she's going to hit me if I get this wrong, 18 <laughs> years, I want to say, into, into being together now. I'm waiting for her to bang the door down now to tell me I'm wrong. Um <laughs> So I think it was successful for the most part. So the question is, do you think online dating sites are effective? I mean, considering like that my parents who are having a really successful relationship and that we have a successful relationship as a family, I'd say, yeah, they're pretty effective. They can, like, especially since you can meet people that on the Internet that you'd probably never meet in real life. Um, I definitely think that online dating can be very effective for plenty of people. Okay. And obviously I'll agree with that. Otherwise, mom will divorce me. <laughs> um, uh, is there sufficient relationship counseling for teens? Do you feel that if you have questions or confusions or uh, just want to have something explained to you, do you feel that there are sufficient resources for you either – I don't want to say at home, but in school, for instance, do you think there's there's counselors, guidance counselors or whatever, or any kind of resources that you can go and ask questions? I mean, I guess maybe with the guidance counselors, I don't know. I've never really asked them about, like, it never came up that about relationships specifically, Um they never really discussed it with me. It was kind of just, okay, tell me if you're, like, tell me about, like, 
just kind of tell me about what you like and stuff. Um, it never really came up, like, about relationships and about how I wanted to have a relationship. I'm guessing if I asked, they would probably have some answers. It's just that kind of thing was never really discussed in school with me. So the jury's kind of still out on that one. Yeah. Just for the record, um, Mommy did confirm. Well, first of all, she put 2004 up like I'm going to be able to do math because math is hard. <laughs> but she did confirm 17 years last month. So I was one year off. That's not bad. <laughs> That's not bad. That's not to say it feels longer. I don't want to say that because that could come across wrong. But 17 years is a pretty successful relationship so far. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Question seven. Are social events at school a good place to take a date? Understanding this question relates to non-COVID related conditions. Uh, uh, um, I'm not entirely sure. Once again, there was never really like a bunch of talk about relationships and stuff. Like I can see a bunch of people taking their dates to the prom, but I don't know, like, I don't know how the teachers would react, I guess. And since we never really brought up that kind of stuff, I don't, I'm not entirely sure if it would have been a good idea. Like, they could definitely be fun, but uh, if I personally wanted to date, I'd probably just do something outside of school. Just The reason I put this in here is, <clears throat> in my youth... That was a lot of what your socializing was. Dances at school, uh, taking your date to the football game, hanging out with your friends. A lot of what dating was for me as a kid was hanging out with my friends. I, I might be dating one of them, but it was mostly hanging out with friends. So a lot of times it was going to concerts at school, uh, going to the school play, stuff like that. They were all... I mean, I came from a small town, too, so there wasn't a lot of socializing that could be had around town. Really, everything revolved around what we did at school. Uh, I don't think schools are, are quite that center of social society anymore, though, are they? Uh, not really. Um, like, I only, like, I had a dance in, um, sixth grade and there were two dances that you could go to um in when i was in seventh grade um there are like a few um dances but the thing is like like i mean we had games and stuff but i was the type of person who really didn't go to that kind of stuff like we did have social events it's just um Oh, no. You just didn't go to the social events. I just, yeah, that's just my... Okay, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. I didn't go to a lot of myself either, but... <laughs> yeah. I had to ask. Um, question number eight. Can you just be friends after breaking things off with a romantic interest? The dreaded let's just be friends line. I mean, I think it's possible, especially if you two were really good friends um, before you started dating. And then you can kind of figure that, hey, maybe it might not work. We don't work in a romantic sense, but we work in a friendship sense. Why don't we just be friends? And sure, there can be instances where it's a bit awkward, but I definitely... Awkward. But I definitely think people can move past that, and I'm pretty sure people have, and they can be friends with their ex-partners. Okay, so here's another good question. Is it okay to date the ex-partner of your friend? Okay, there's a couple things that factor into this. One, do you, is the ex-partner a good person? Well, well <laughs> we're not going to get deep in it. We're not doing psychoanalysis. Yeah. If your best friend breaks up with their friend, their their significant other, is it okay for you to date their their former significant significant other? I'd say as long as their friend's okay with it. Like, so you need to ask permission first. Like, I think you can have, like, a well-talked discussion about it, like... A civilized discussion, I definitely think it could be possible. A lot of people probably think that, oh, it's go it's just gonna end in disaster. Well, I think that it that it could also not end in disaster, so Okay. So there's a chance that it might work. 
Yeah. Gotcha. You got to be tactful with it. Yeah. So the last question we have, I think we've kind of already answered this, but I'll give you a chance to expound on it. Is it okay not to date at all while in high school? Of course. Like, a lot of people can be too busy for a relationship. A lot of people, like, can probably um, not care for being in a relationship. And there's a bunch of people who can probably just be okay with just having friends and not really feel as though they need a significant other. Okay. Sounds good. That's it for this segment. We'll be right back and we'll finish off with our technology questions. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. We're getting teen perspectives today. We're talking about technology now. <clears throat> this lightning round. We're up against the clock here, so we've got to run through these quickly. Are we too dependent on computers today? I'm pretty sure, yeah. We probably have a little too much dependence on technology at this point. So, yeah, the answer is yes. Okay. <clears throat> Speaking in general terms, are parents clueless about child predators on the Internet? I mean, I'm pretty sure lots of parents are aware. Some parents are probably more clueless than others because, one, they either don't care or, two, they're just clueless. They don't entirely have a lot of knowledge of that. But I definitely think that there are ways that parents can learn about this and make sure that they protect their child from child predators. Good point. Cell phones. Are cell phones dangerous or detrimental to teens? I mean... To some teens, they could be, like, but to others, they can definitely be helpful. Like, maybe some teens can do something on their phone that can cause them to have, that can cause them to put, be put in danger, but normally it's be probably because they weren't mature enough to have it. Um, but it can also be beneficial to plenty of other teens. So, it can be, but... I don't think it's entirely dangerous. So situational. Yes. Okay. Do violent video games cause behavioral problems? I don't think so. I used to play a violent video game with you called Call of Duty, and normally we would um, play this game whenever I would have a bad day, and usually playing with you, making some kind of comedy, and shooting pixels made me happier, and I was no longer that stressed. Um, it didn't turn me into, like, a bloodthirsty killer. Um, That's good to <laughs> which, know. Which, for some reason, people believe. But playing that game just kind of let me blow off some steam. And it's probably better to have a way to blow off steam instead of bursting around other people where you really can get a bit violent. Good point. So, do you think about cybersecurity before you use technology? Not really i kind of just figured that like you being the tech guy that you are you would kind of make sure that you would kind of take care of that in a way uh, as so a, that's my problem i mean as a teen <laughs> myself i really never thought that i had to worry about that and i never did so okay we're gonna have to have an offline discussion about that then okay are passwords a poor way to secure technology? As long as you're safe with your password, I don't think so. 
Um, especially, but if you end up leaking your password, it can definitely be a poor way of security, so you should probably have a backup in case, like, especially if you're, you kind of have your pass, you have a way of your password out to other people, you should have another wall of defense. Um, but for the most part, I'm pretty sure as long as you keep your passwords hidden from other people, then I'm pretty sure that's fine. Okay. Uh, is technology important in schools today? Well, today, yes. When we were in school, I would say that was still pretty important. Um, we could use technology as a tool for learning and, um, being in a school that had, that used technology, um, for learning. I don't entirely think I, um, I don't know what it would be like if we had no type of technology, so... Okay, yeah, I think it's definitely essential right now. Mm -hmm. So, thinking in broader terms of all technology, is technology a tool, a convenience, or a burden for you? Well, it can definitely be a tool, especially when it comes to school. Um, I use my laptop for school. I use a calculator and for math in case I c in case like it's a larger number that I can't entirely. Um, uh, you know, enough fingers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I guess we can do with that. Um, and uh, it can also be a convenience for entertainment purposes, stress relieving purposes, that kind of thing. Um, and a burden in some ways. Uh, um, like if it doesn't work properly, if I'm trying to do something and it just frustrates me. Um, it's definitely kind of all of the above. Okay, good answer. Well-rounded answer. Is technology a threat to privacy? More than likely, yes, because using technology, there's a lot of your personal data that is on the internet that everyone can see at this point. So, in a way, yes, it's a pretty big threat to privacy. And the last question that we have for today is facial recognition in public places okay? Could you give me an example of where that can be applied? A uh, great example right now, you walk into a supermarket, walk into Walmart, and you see a big TV screen up there, and you see it draw little boxes around your face as you're walking around, and it's doing facial recognition. Uh, you go to an airport, and the airports all have cameras, and the cameras are doing facial recognition. You go to a concert at, a, at an auditorium, and there's cameras that do facial recognition, and they run your facial um, images against the database of known criminals or wanted individuals or something like that. And if your face turns up a, a match, they wind up pulling you out of line and taking you in, and you talk to security or the police or something like that. Cameras are everywhere today, which means that facial recognition potentially is everywhere today. Ah. I definitely think in a lot of instances it is kind of okay because it is just a way to be safe. But on the other hand, yeah, it is kind of weird having yourself be recorded over and over again in public places. Okay. So that was all we had today. Um, and I think that's the last we had in this series for right now. I'm sure we'll come up with more in the series uh, at a later date. Before we go, I would want to once again uh, suggest folks subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe to video versions of all of our shows. Uh, if you look for insights into things, you can get audio versions of this podcast. If you look up insights into teens, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Stitcher, and anywhere you can get a podcast these days. We would also invite folks to give us your feedback. We're looking for uh, show suggestions, topics that we can discuss, uh, feedback on how we're doing. Are we doing a good job? You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get high res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We stream six days a week, really five days a week at this point, since we started recording during the week. Uh, we stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a free monthly Twitch Prime 
subscription. We'd appreciate it if you threw that our way. You can get audio versions of this podcast at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We are on Instagram at insights into things, or you can get us on our main website at www.insightsintothings.com. And you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights in the Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights in the Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother, Sam. That's it. Another in the books. Bye, everyone. <laughs>